It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. The art of preservation is something that's really important to me, largely because there are many artworks such as movies, paintings, drawings, you name it, that we cannot possibly see to this very day because people back then didn't necessarily care about preservation and it seems as though it's the same case when it comes down to video games. There's a new study that's been done by the Video Game History Foundation that says that 87% missing the disappearance of classic video games. New study reveals most classic video games are completely unavailable. Now this 51 page study goes into great details about the various aspects that they use to find out how exactly is that 87% of video games are not necessarily being preserved. It says right here that the study analyzed a data set representing over 4,000 historical video games <clears throat> released in the United States before 2010 to determine whether they have been reissued or are otherwise still available to the rights holders. The survey examined four sample groups, each representing a different segment of the diverse population of video games. A sample of all historical games released before 2010, games for the Commodore 64, a platform that represent an abandoned ecosystem with the lowest level of commercial interest, games for the Game Boy platform finally an eclectic ecosystem with demonstrable commercial interest but decline in availabilities, games for the PlayStation 2, an active ecosystem with high recommercialization activity for multiple parties. And it finds that only 13% of classic video games published in the United States are currently in release. This figure is comparable to the commercial availability of pre-World War II audio recordings at least 10% or less, or the survival rate of American silent films about 14%, and other mediums are at risk. These levels are consistent across platform ecosystems and time periods. All three platform libraries examined for this study have a poor reissue rate despite the commercial interest. Despite vastly different numbers of the platform owner activity, the Commodore 64 and Game Boy family ecosystems are both effectively abandoned, while our example of commercial available ecosystem, the PlayStation 2 ecosystem, only reaches an equal rate of about 12% across all platforms. No five year period from 1960 to 2009 rates over above 20% availability. Now on the data right here, it says that all historical games, at least 13.27% in release, the Commodore 64, only 4.50% in release, for the Game Boy Family, about 5% is released, and for the PS2, only 12% are actually released. So what exactly are the main factors on why so many games are being lost? Now according to the study it says that historically significant games with low commercial values are especially unlikely to be reissued. The reissue rate fell below 3% for all games released prior to 1985, a period with high historical importance to the early video game industry but with minimum commercial activity. The Commodore 64, an important platform for the 1980 computer gaming industry, showed both the lowest available rate and the lowest diversity of reissue sources of any ecosystem we examine. This is evidence that the interests of the marketplace do not align with the needs of video game researchers. The second factor is that the digital marketplace threatened the availability of game reissues, while games do get reissued, the long-term and stability of digital game distribution platforms mean that they often lapse out of release, especially in ecosystems where there's a low diversity of reissue sources. 6.5% of the Game Boy library was previously available only through Nintendo's virtual console standpoints for the Wii U and 3DS platforms. But since those services shut down in March 2023, those games are no longer available in any form. Other legacy digital stores are still running, such as the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita stores 
I have experienced a slight degradation in service quality that user are effectively unable to purchase titles that are technically in commerce. Now, other things that are also part of the study was also mentioning the fact that there are various kind of licensing challenges for video games, especially games that use properties that are owned by different companies. It also mentions that the ownership challenges for game issues is sometimes a factor on why the games do not get re-released for other consoles. It also mentioned that, of course, other kind of challenges for digital game availability. So basically, this study, I would highly recommend you guys to check it out when you guys get the free time to read it. After reading a study like this, I guess the question then becomes, well, geez, Tyler, is it actually a good thing or a bad thing that people are privating video games on emulators? And my answer is kind of like in the middle because I understand the argumentation for both sides of the fence. I do think that for new video game releases, that the artists do in fact deserve every single last penny that they made for that game. And so I do in fact encourage people to buy as many new releases as possible. Now, as far as people doing what they want with their copy, that's entirely on them because I do think that selling used copies is actually a good thing and not necessarily a bad thing. So yes, you can actually sell the used copy of the new game you want to and buy the new copy of the game you want to directly from the artist. And so on that kind of issue, I'm actually against, you can say, the idea of privating new games. But on the flip side, if we're talking about video games that are so incredibly hard to find, and we're talking about games that are like, you know, really, really old, and you cannot get it on any type of platform whatsoever, I cannot really say that I'm actually against, you know, the idea of, like, privacy either, because basically the only kind of way to play these games is through privacy, not to mention the artists probably had the money anyway from the original release, and so there's, like, no sort of difference between buying a used copy at a store for that old game and privacying like the whole entire ROM on your computer. Also at the same time, when you buy a copy of a video game that's brand new, you also have the right to rip the whole entire game on the computer as long as that person doesn't necessarily sell that copy on the computer. But on the flip side, if that copy of the video game that the person has on the computer is like the only way to play that lost video game, then maybe it's actually morally justified to probably, you know, share the copy of that ROM on the computer to the rest of the world. This is why I said earlier in the video that I'm not necessarily against the idea of privacy or emulation, and this is why I also said I understand the frustration of creators too, because I think that the answer is not either you can't be for it or against it. It's like, I think it's pretty much in the middle when it comes down to this kind of conversation. But uh, what do you guys think about this study? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.